Jacqueline, could you talk a bit about uh, what you're looking to do with the United States, where in some places, be it inner cities or Appalachia or the Mississippi Delta, we have poverty and, uh, and hopelessness as bad as in any place in the third world? Thank you for asking that question, and you're absolutely right. Um, the, in, the, in the US, we're actually looking at three different areas. Where'd you go? There you are. Thank you. <laughs> Um, in three different areas. One is um, workforce development, the second is financial inclusion, and the third is in healthcare. And I actually think that um, part of the, the reason that Acumen is so excited about this is that we've got to change the narrative, that we are no longer, as you insinuate, the rich world and the poor world. We now have elements of the rich and the poor worlds within every country, including this one. And so um, what excites me is that we're seeing innovation in other countries that we can bring here. What also excites me is in this moment of such divisiveness between left and right, I think that there's real opportunity to show through the entrepreneurs how we're different from the rest of the world and that we've got a really big government system. It's just not working as effectively as it could. So a couple of the first investments that we're looking at already um, include um, one on workforce development that is um, that's working with community colleges across the country that like these maternal health care hospitals are woefully under-resourced and so ha may have one um, career counselor for 2,000 students. And so while these students are getting trained in vocational training, they can't find jobs and they often end up at McDonald's or other service um, jobs. Whereas on the other side, the truck drivers, the, the, the much higher paying jobs that the corporates are needing are going unfilled. And so can you build a company that creates a matching service between the, the, the community colleges and the corporates that, that need to fill these jobs would be one example of it. In healthcare, there, we're starting to see some really interesting examples. Again, many of them are learning from India and Africa that um, essentially keep people healthy and out of the hospital to reduce the cost to Obamacare so that you can actually create a revenue generating model that allows the company to exist and be sustainable, that keeps people healthy, and that reduces the cost to the government. And these kinds of examples are so thrilling to me to remind ourselves that we have this entrepreneurial talent and we should be using it, sharing it, and learning and being part of um, just thinking differently about how the world can change. So thank you for that question. I was hoping you could expand a bit about how Acumen decides on what investments to back, especially because you know it's patient capital. This is a fairly long time horizon. Most of the management teams are, you know, they have no proven track records. There's no cash flow that you can do a DCF of. How do you actually sort of gain the conviction that those are the right companies to back um, and that you don't end up inadvertently subsidizing something, you know, further down the road and it doesn't break even? Thanks. Um, the, the, it's a great question. The, we, um, we look at about 100 companies for every investment that we make. Uh, we look at three things. The most important is the uh, entrepreneur. Um, do they have both the imagination to actually dream big and equally the capability, on, and I would say self-awareness, to understand that they probably aren't the one to do all of the management. They better have a strong management team that understands what they're doing. Do they have a track record of sorts? Um, to, show, to prove to us that they also understand who their customers are. We rarely invest in startups. We need to see some evidence that there is a business model that could potentially work. And we're very much focused on understanding the business model and convincing ourselves that this one can scale. Where we've changed is that we used to look at, um, we used to define sustainability only in terms of the private market. And what we're seeing now is that if you can get the market to work in the short term, often your real path to scale is in partnership with government. But government can only really partner with you if they see the value of your business model. And that's what we're hoping to prove with LifeSpring. 
Hi, Jacqueline. Thank you very much for your talk. It was incredibly inspiring. Um, I have a question. In regards to the companies that you choose to back, um, how difficult is it for them to get the buy-in, not only for from the customers, um, but especially in the differences in the uh, or the differences in the changes of culture, um, not only from Acumen but within the society. Um, the differences, the change in culture, meaning. And... Um, how can I? Uh, if it's, a, for example, a village, um, to get the backing from the tribal leaders to make sure that they can understand and uh, agree with the model that is being suggested. That's a great. That's that's. Uh, you know, I I think in in that way it really depends. Um, I'm just thinking about the last week. Um, and uh, we visited a school, a private sector school uh, in, Rajas in Rajasthan, I think. No, also outside Hyderabad. And uh, what was so remarkable to me was how many girls were there. And 10 years ago, you wouldn't have seen that many girls at this school. It was really cool. Even more exciting was the, the, the reorientation that these entrepreneurs were taking that rather than just set up a school, again, with low expectations for what the kids and the parents deserved, they were having a parent's day. And these kids were incredible. They were so articulate and so beautiful. And the parents were almost to a person illiterate farmers. And to see these children articulate to their parents what they were doing and then translate for us for me, showed how quickly this generational change actually can happen. And the next day in Rajasthan, where women, which is a very conservative area, where women don't make a lot of the decisions, um, I'd say you're looking at two tracks. On the one track, we saw the, the, the women now owning all of these different lights. And there was this incredible moment where I asked the women about why they bought these lights. And most of the lights were D-lights. Um, a woman said to me, well, we've, we've seen our children um, die from kerosene burning. So I told her the story of Sam. And um, she said, please, when you, when you meet that man again, would you thank him on behalf of all of us? And I think that there's a change that's happening in the conversation where people feel like they are more part of the conversation. That said, the man who distributes the D-lights um, took a huge step forward in hiring his daughter-in-law as his first employee. Really unheard of in this community. Um, I was really excited, and I asked her what she was doing with her new found money. And she said, um, well, she's not allowed to touch the money. Uh, he controls all the money. So it was a step <laughs> forward. And if you've been doing it as long as I've been doing it, you like to celebrate those steps. But then you keep pushing, and you do not stop. Um, and so it's, I think I've learned the idea of patience for impatient people. And it's holding this intention all the time to celebrate that man and then talk to him the benefit, about the benefits of what life might be if she had her own pocket money. Um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs>